You're listening to Diaspork Music on Black Power 96 with Melinda Francis, Norman Richmond. And we just completed the Jazz Zone with TN Providence. And he did a lot of, uh, he talked about, he ended talking about Max Roach. But before he talked about Max Roach, he talked about uh, uh, Herbie Nichols. Herbie Nichols, who Dr. Gerald Horn has uh, talked about in his book on, on his ja- in his jazz book. But uh, Herbie Nichols was from uh, St. Kitts Nevis. And, uh, you know, St. Kitts Nevis produced... Uh, uh, many, many, many people, including uh, Taj, Taj Mahal. One side of Taj Mahal's family is from uh, St. Kitts, Kitts. A great friend of mine, Howard Matthews, who owned the uh, Underground Railroad. With he was married to Salome Bay. He was from uh, uh, St. Kitts, and uh, Minister Farrakhan and his cousin uh, Cecily Tyson. Uh, they are from. Uh, Nevis, or their background is uh, Nevis, which is a uh, twin island of uh, uh, St. Kitts. And as the lady who used to be the editor, my editor at the Toronto Star, whose name I won't mention, Ann Moon, always told me that you know too much. But anyway, uh, Dr. Horn, how are you doing today? Hey, it's all good. And I should also mention that the late Randall Robinson, the anti-apartheid campaigner, uh, spent his last years in St. Kitts. Right. He married Hayes, the sister named Hazel, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. That is uh, correct. I guess the first thing I want to, I'm going to throw you, throw you not, a, not a curve, but I'm going to throw you a, a, a sinker. I wanted to talk about the, uh, that, the, the, the documentary on Bill Russell. I was watching it last night and I'm I have always been fascinated with uh, with Bill Russell. Uh, you know, Bill Russell. The a lot of people don't know that he was a uh, he was a great uh, track and field man. He he was a high jumper. Uh, he, well, he was a, what he was like was that Jimmy Castor song. He Jimmy uh, uh, Bill Russell was an E man. He could almost do anything. Uh, would you agree with that? Well, for those who may not be familiar. Bill Russell was a black American, six foot, 10 inches tall, grew up initially in Monroe, Louisiana, before migrating to Oakland, California, and then to the University of San Francisco, where he starred in basketball. I think they won 55 straight games and then migrating to Boston, where he starred for the Boston Celtics professional team. Even though Michael Jordan is oftentimes viewed as the premier hoopster of all time, having won six championships, of course, Russell won 11 championships, two as a player coach, by the way, which is something that neither Michael Jordan nor LeBron James have been able to do thus far. And Bill Russell was something of a political activist, uh, that is to say that he uh, campaigned on behalf of Muhammad Ali when he got into hot water for not wanting to enter the U.S. military so that he could be sent to Vietnam. Uh, He campaigned against U.S. apartheid, Jim Crow, and he faced enormous pressure in Boston. Now, for those who may not know, uh, Boston has a lingering reputation as being one of the worst cities in terms of racism in the United States of America, which may come as a surprise to those who see it as a town of cosmopolitan flavor, the Athens of the U.S., as it's called. But not so for Russell. He tells anecdotes about when he would be playing games, there would be break-ins at his home with racists leaving feces in his bedroom, on the bed, in fact. And I have to say that Russell had this habit of regurgitating before games. And I connect that as a non-clinical observer to the stress that he was under uh, in Boston for all those many years. And of course, he died a year or two ago at the age of 88, and his legacy lingers on. And uh, last thing about him, his brother is Charlie Russell, who wrote the, 
was a was a playwright. He did the film uh, uh, Five on the Black Hand side, which was uh, the music was done by an old comrade of mine, H. B. Barnum. Mm-hmm. And um, Melinda, you want to lead the questions off? Yeah, let's get into it. Let's talk about the TikTok ban. Well, this is very curious. TikTok, t- TikTok, excuse me, is an app. Uh, it's wildly popular in the United States, particularly with our youth. And what's curious is that there is now a de facto ban on TikTok in the United States because of so-called, so-called national security reasons, even though President Biden himself has used TikTok in his campaign. So I'm not sure what that says about him as a, a possible a vector for Chinese propaganda. But in any case, I think it represents a wider and larger trend, not only with regard to growing U.S. hysteria about the challenge provided by China. After all, China produces more engineers annually than the United States by several orders of magnitude, and the de facto outlawing of affirmative action uh, means that the United States will be handicapped further in seeking to develop uh, engineers. Uh, China is also in the passing lane with regard to solar energy. I, I dare say that if the North Atlantic countries tend to move away from solar energy, it may have something to do with the fact that in order to pursue that field, they'll be dependent upon solar panels from China, uh, which will heighten their dependency upon this country ruled by a communist party. And of course, electric vehicles, BYD, which we've mentioned before, is now eating the lunch of Tesla. And so there is a lot of hysteria as a result, but I think U.S. imperialism hasn't considered that if the U.S. can de facto outlaw TikTok, well, then why can't China go after Tesla, which has major productive facilities in China, not to mention uh, Apple, Microsoft, Starbucks, the list is long. But it represents a wider trend because there's not only hysteria about China, simultaneously, Uh, U.S. imperialism is seeking to prevent Nippon Steel of Japan from buying a flailing U.S. steel manufacturer. And this has been endorsed by Mr. Trump as well. And it seems to me that if the U.S. is going to cross swords with a major Japanese manufacturer, It makes me wonder how they're going to enlist Japan in Cold War II against the People's Republic of China. And what this illustrates is that U.S. imperialism has these mantras about the free flow of capital and the free flow of ideas, but they really don't mean that. What they really mean is a one-way street. That is to say, U.S. capital should be able to penetrate any market on planet Earth, but in the other direction, not so much. And it's not just the United States, because as we speak, you have Redbird Capital, which is led by the disgraced former leader of CNN, speaking of Jeff Zucker, who is backed by capital from United Arab Emirates, which is seeking to purchase the Daily Telegraph in London, which has been stymied thus far by London itself. And once again, This has many in the UAE rather upset. They're wondering the same thing I'm wondering, uh, whether the free flow of capital is a one-way street. And what this really illustrates, uh, it seems to me, is the heightening contradictions that are currently enmeshing U.S. imperialism as it enters its terminal stage of decline. It's tossing overboard uh, many of its mantras and revealing itself to the world in a way that the more sagacious amongst us have already sensed, that it basically is bent and determined on global domination, and any who seem to get in the way of that project 
be it a China ruled by a communist party, or be it a Japan ruled by the liberal democratic party, a member in good standing of the capitalist elite, or be it the United Arab Emirates, which is seeking to climb the greasy pole of capitalism, if they get in the way, uh, they will be blocked. However, US imperialism in its terminal stage needs allies more than ever. But I don't see how that's going to be accomplished with this kind of double standard. Uh, you are listening to Diaspora Music on Black Power 96 with Melinda Francis Norman Richmond, and we are in conversation with Dr. Gerald Horn. Uh, could you ask the question, or could I a- ask you the question, why has the Democratic Party, specifically uh, Joe Biden, uh, criticized or semi-criticized uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in his role? Uh, or has criticized him. Could you talk about that? Well, not only uh, Mr. Biden, but the leading Jewish American official, speaking of Senator Chuck Schumer of New York State, the Senate Majority Leader, he gave a lengthy speech just the other day, uh, basically suggesting that Mr. Netanyahu has lost his way, his words, not mine, calling for new elections and By the way, he also called for a change in leadership of the Palestinian Authority as well, which I think it's fair to say was rather arrogant. At least one can say that given the fact that Mr. Schumer has carried so much water for Israel, that he has some authority with regard to calling for internal changes in their political setup. But he's been an enemy. I think it's fair to say, a Palestinian. So I'm not see, I don't see what gives them the authority or the right to do so, to call for a change in leadership in the Palestinian Authority. But I think what this reflects is what I was just talking about a moment ago, which is the geostrategic decline of U.S. imperialism, which has been heightened and exacerbated by the genocide in Gaza executed by Mr. Netanyahu and his comrades, which is leading to severe reputational damage for the North Atlantic camp. And this is seen by the reality that the foreign policy coordinator of the European Union, speaking of Joseph Burrell of Spain, has been much more critical of Israel than his counterparts in Berlin or Paris or London. The Irish, and I think this is important to mention on St. Patrick's Day, uh, their leadership also has been critical of Israel. I I think that the fact that historic Palestine and Ireland share a a similar colonial heritage in terms of being oppressed by London may shed light on that. And so what's happening is that U.S. imperialism is beginning to suspect that Israel is an albatross around the neck of U.S. imperialism, that it's no longer the unsinkable aircraft carrier in West Asia that it was thought to be when a younger Joseph Biden suggested that if Israel did not exist, the United States would have to invent it. Israel, because of its ham-fisted approach to Gaza, has hampered the ability, not only of the United States to focus on Russia, but to focus on China as well. And for those who feel that the relationship between Israel and US imperialism is so intertwined that uh, there is no daylight between the two, well, I understand that sentiment, particularly given the role that Zionist billionaires play in funding the Democratic Party and the Republican Party as well. I'm thinking of the Adelson family of Las Vegas, heavily invested in casinos, but also casinos casinos in Macau uh, under the administration of the People's Republic of China, which in some ways is outstripping Las Vegas and Nevada as a whole. And of course, uh, the leaders of Persian capital, including Bill Ackman, who contribute to the Democrats and helped to bring down uh, Claudia Gay, the first black woman president of Harvard University. 
But that needs to be weighed against some of the major debacles of U.S. intelligence. Uh, speaking of the Jonathan Pollard incident of some decades ago, when this Jewish American analyst for U.S. intelligence sent massive files from the United States secret cache to Israel, which was said to have compromised greatly U.S. intelligence during the Cold War. He served a lengthy term in prison before being released to Israel. And the Jonathan Pollard case illustrates how at times, Israel and U.S. imperialism are not on the same page, that their interests diverge. And we've mentioned on this program more than once the fact that Israel has been known to leak U.S. intelligence to the People's Republic of China, or U.S. military technology, which is not a favorite of the Pentagon, that kind of activity. And so you see this, this increasing rift between Israel and the United States, not uh, advantaged by the fact that the so-called Abraham Accords negotiated by Mr. Trump, which led to Sudan and Morocco and Bahrain improving relations with Israel, including the UAE, United Arab Emirates, besides. But now the Abraham Accords are unraveling, and this too is a concern for U.S. intelligence and the Pentagon and the White House and Senator Schumer. And in that context, recall that just a few days ago, the leader or a leader of the war cabinet, speaking of Benny Gantz, who is a genocidaire himself, but once Mr. Netanyahu's job, uh, came to Washington to the consternation of Mr. Netanyahu. There, It's no secret that the U.S. administration feels that Netanyahu has damaged goods. They would like to replace him with Benny Gantz, although I'm not sure if that'll be a net plus for the Palestinians. Mr. Netanyahu will not go away quietly. He's already criticized Mr. Schumer. He apparently thus far is not calling for new elections. Expect him to turn up in the United States speaking before Republicans. And he's done that before. Recall that during the Obama years, when Mr. Obama was trying to negotiate a nuclear accord with Iran, Mr. Netanyahu came to Washington to denounce that accord. And so we see that this rift is deepening. And in fact, if you look at what's happening in this hemisphere, you get a further glimpse of that. I'm speaking of the fact that the President Lula of Brazil has spoken in very harsh terms about the genocide echoed by President Petro of Colombia, who's spoken in similar terms about the genocide in uh, historic Palestine. And then there's the growing rift with South Africa, uh, which is evidenced by South Africa, not only bringing this case before the International Court of Justice, which ruled that there was a plausible case for genocide against the Palestinians, but also the prospect that uh, Washington itself could be added as an aider and a better in genocide, uh, which could compromise the execution of U.S. foreign policy. And I think that, as I might have said previously, uh, this may have something to do with the recent change in the sanctions regime against Zimbabwe, where national sanctions were eased although sanctions against the leaders were tightened. I think that Washington would like to improve relations with Zimbabwe in the long term in order to gain leverage against South Africa. Certainly they're doing that with Angola uh, as we speak, although I'm not sure if that's working since President Lorenzo of Angola just this past week was in the People's Republic of China breaking bread. And in any case, uh, the U.S. imperialism would like to sample the lithium of Zimbabwe which is essential for the green economy, but Zimbabwe does not necessarily want to play ball because uh, it expelled the Agency of International Development of the United States, which is the major purveyor of foreign aid, just as this new sanctions regime was being adjusted. So this is part and parcel of this crisis of U.S. imperialism. And I would like to make a policy recommendation. Uh, 
uh, given this crisis of U.S. imperialism, we have long thought that the black liberation movement in this country is not doing all that it can with regard with regard to uh, putting U.S. imperialism on the defensive and more to the point, uh, winning the reparations battle. And in that regard, note that in November 2023, the African Union and CARICOM Caribbean community met in West Africa vowing to push forward with regard to reparations. I'm not sure if our advocates in North America are even aware of that important meeting. But in any case, what needs to happen at this point is for groups, organizations, even individuals in the Black liberation movement in the United States of America to begin to send delegations to the African Union in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, to CARICOM in Georgetown, Guyana, uh, and if they're a bit nervous about going to China and Russia, well, go to Japan, because there has been an historic relationship, that is to say, in the first few decades of the 20th century, in the latter decades of the 19th century, between our movement and Tokyo, of course, that went up in ashes with the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but with the contradictions between Tokyo and and Washington already enunciated, this might be a, an opportunity to do so. And likewise, uh, we should not ignore the contradictions between the European Union and the United States, uh, evidence in Ukraine, evidence in the battle between Boeing of the US and Airbus of the EU. And of course, Boeing is really losing that battle parenthetically. I mean, I'm almost afraid to get on a Boeing airplane. It seems that they have incidents on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis. And our audience may want to emulate uh, my nervousness and skepticism about Boeing. But anyway, the, the bottom line is that U.S. imperialism is in crisis. Its geostrategic position is deteriorating. And this opens opportunities for the black liberation movement that it should not ignore. You're talking, we're speaking with uh, Dr. Jerohun. I have a two point question for you. How strong are the uh, anti uh, Netanyahu forces in Israel one? And could you talk about the uh, collaborators with, with Zionism, specifically uh, Mr. Hakeem Jeff Jeffries, who is uh, the nephew of uh, Leonard Jeffries, a, a Afrocentric scholar, and uh, I think he was one time he was a man who led a. He talked about white people being the ice people and so on and so forth. And uh, could you explain uh, what is what is Hakeem, Hakeem Jeffries is the, is the, the leader of the opposition in the Democratic Party? Am I right in saying that? He's the speaker in waiting, which is one right. of the leading positions in the political structure of U.S. imperialism. He's from Brooklyn, as you noted. He's the nephew of Leonard Jeffries. And it would not surprise me at all, to be frank, if the U.S. intelligence and the FBI might have done something, such as go through the student newspaper at his undergraduate college, speaking of Binghamton University in upstate New York, and might have found quotes from Mr. Jeffries about his uncle that could be quite compromising. It, re it reminds me of uh, Askia Muhammad, the late commentator on WPFW in Washington, writer for the Nation of Islam newspaper. He had these photographs of Obama with Farrakhan, both smiling from ear to ear, that he hid until Obama left office. And it would not surprise me if Hafkin Jeffrey says something in his closet as well. And of course, being from Brooklyn, with New York State and New York City and Brooklyn being the epicenter of Zionist activism, it should not be a surprise that he and other black New York politicians, such as Al Sharpton and Mayor Eric Adams, uh, Gregory Meeks of Southeast Queens, the ranking Democrat on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, are all in the tank uh, for Zionism. Now, with regard to anti-Netanyahu elements, the, the problem, or a problem, I should say, in Israel is that the populace, the electorate, has swung to the right. 
in the aftermath of October 7th. And even though it does appear that Netanyahu would lose the next election, as already indicated, the presumed replacement, Benny Gantz, is no angel and, in fact, is similarly hawkish. And you can say the same thing for Mr. Gallant, who is the leader of the Israeli military, who has crossed swords with Mr. Netanyahu previously, uh, but is similarly hawkish. But as I have mentioned more than once in previous programs, uh, there are Israeli analysts, or analysts of Israel, I should say, such as the scholar Elon Pape, who suggests that we are witnessing the beginning of the end of the entire Zionist project that may sound overly ambitious in light of the genocide being inflicted, but given the fact that Israel has abandoned a good deal of its northern territory because of the challenge from Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, abandoned a good deal of southern uh, Israel abutting uh, Gaza uh, post-October 7th, that is to say its borders are shrinking, its economy is shrinking. Uh, the prospects for Israel are rather grim and glum. And so, as Pape has suggested, the fact that he espies the beginning of the end for the Zionist project does not mean that a walk in the park or a stroll on the beach is ahead. Because when such a settler colonial project may be in its death throes, in some ways, it's the most dangerous of all, a lesson that we should not ignore in this own settler colonial enterprise known as the United States of America. You're listening to Diaspora Music on Black Power 96. We only have about seven minutes left. And uh, before we expire, I just wanted to, uh, this is on Gerald Horn's time, but I wanted to send a shout out to my nephew, uh, Aaron Humber, whose birthday is today. Uh, it's also the birthday of uh, Nat King Cole. And once again, I'll send this out to Ann Moon. Uh, my uh, uh, Aaron is named, uh, Aaron's mother is named uh, Lorraine. And she was named after Nat King Cole's song, Sweet Lorraine. So if you're listening, Miss uh, uh Toronto star, Miss Moon. I still, I still like to show off that I know a little bit about uh, my own history, my own culture. And uh, another question, Melinda. Uh, well, we we're running out of time. Where do we want to start? Do you want to talk about maybe um, talk about um, Boeing and um, China? Um, China's Airbus? Well, I mentioned before that U.S. Boeing and European Union Airbus are battling for global markets with regard to commercial airplanes. But coming up from behind is COMAC, C-O-M-A-C, of the People's Republic of China. And if electric vehicles are any indication, Boeing in particular has something to worry about because I've already mentioned the fact it's designing planes that are crashing. Uh, you might have seen this scene from a Boeing plane where a door flew off in midair, believe it or not. And it's de dealing with emergency landings on a regular basis, believe it or not. This has something to do, I'm afraid to say, with this cowboy capitalism in the United States, which involves cutting corners for the sake of ever more lucrative profits. The problem is that that can be quite dangerous when you're talking about transporting scores, if not hundreds of people at 35,000 feet with doors flying off. This is quite dangerous. And it illustrates once again, the point of our remarks today, which is the deteriorating strategic position of U.S. imperialism, not only vis-a-vis -vis China, but also vis-a-vis -vis Japan and the European Union. I think on this program previously, I've mentioned the book by Anu Bradford, A.N.U. Bradford of Columbia University, 
the Brussels effect, where and I think the subtitle is something like how the EU rules the world, which is seemingly extravagant. But what she's pointing to is the fact that the EU has a market that's larger than the 330 million strong U.S. market, that its regulations on capital, particularly in cyberspace, cyberspace, and it's particularly with regard to social media like Facebook or uh, commodity producers like Apple, are much more rigorous than its U.S. counterpart. And so what happens is that Facebook, Apple, uh, other companies, in order to produce a product that can traverse borders, they basically follow EU regulations, and then those regulations become global regulations. You see something similar with regard to the California effect in the United States. That is to say, California is much more stringent with regard to auto emissions. And so rather than auto manufacturers manufacturing one car for California and another for 49 other states, they basically default to using the California standard nationally. And so the Brussels effect in many ways helps to illustrate the continuing decline of U.S. imperialism, which thinks that its alleged advantage in the military realm will be its saving grace. But given the fact that China is catching up there, or given the fact that we see inexpensive drones able to foil and flummox a multi-million dollar U.S. military contraptions, uh, I think speaking euphemistically, that this ultimate reliance on the military in Washington is misplaced optimism. And we're listening, or we're talking with Dr. Gerald Horn, and I would like to end by saying that I would uh, recommend that everyone uh, check out Gerald Horn's book, Confronting Black Jacobins, and it is about the, the... Haitian Revolution, and we should. Uh, how is that? How uh, how 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 has that book been doing? Has have the sales for that book uh, gone up since the since the uh, you know the situation in Haiti is well is always coming about, but since all the attention is on Haiti now, has there been an interest in that particular book, or or, or can you say? Well, I can say look for a French edition of that book, published in Montreal, by the way, um, by a publisher led by the uh, Haitian Canadian <clears throat> uh, writer and activist, uh, Franz Voltaire. So stay tuned. That sounds good to me, my brother. Uh, I would like to thank you and we'll, we will be back with you uh, Next week, as, as they say in the South, have the good Lord willing and the creek don't rise. Good luck to you. Take care. And we would like to thank Lisa Watson for her technical uh, brilliance per usual. And uh, thank uh, Melinda Francis for putting the show together and uh, uh, specifically the Jean, uh, the brother from our brother in Montreal, uh, Ottawa our Haitian brother, our comrade, and...